For those of you who don't know, here's a map of Australia, and that little upside down triangle right there is Tasmania. On this island, you can find magical mountaintops, enchanting forests, and paralyzing vistas chock full of devils and turbo chooks. You can stumble across a famous sushi chef who attracts customers from all over the world in a small former logging town called Jeeveston. I once shared a few glasses of wine with an accoladed brewer and his racist friend at a cottage in a dark forest in the middle of the night just past Dover. Oh, and I once worked on an apple farm with the world's most bitter Canadian who never missed an opportunity to tell everyone about how his girlfriend had broken up with him while he was backpacking down here. And then she left him there with no money for a plane ticket and he blamed Tasmania for it. And he might be right, this island is such a character, I swear to God. Today's novel of interest is a first novel by a new Tasmanian author, Flames, by Robbie Arnott. Yeah, I know, Flames, Passion, Music, etc. Just leave a comment and get it out of your system. Flames is a wildly unique and adventurous novel set entirely in Tasmania, following the stories of two adult siblings' encounters with the magical side of the island. The story itself is reasonably straightforward, barring your suspension of disbelief in magic. However, the novel's most interesting feature is the constant changing perspectives and styles. Each chapter features a new narrator, adapts the writing style, and even adopts the perspectives of side characters, producing an anthology of voices that all come together to tell the story of the siblings. It takes a couple of chapters to adapt yourself around this quirky premise, but if you can acclimatize to the presentation, then the rest of the novel maintains an easy and comfortable flow. It's a wildly inventive read that remains unpredictable and entertaining for most of the time spent with it. Now, in the interest of balance, the novel does have some shortcomings. A few of the variations in writing style between chapters are underdeveloped. I'd say there's a disappointing skew towards third-person omniscient narrator as the novel goes on, the romance between two of the characters didn't quite read as authentic, and a lot of the details in some of the early to mid-chapters feel more like bloat than they should. However, the positives for this novel far outweigh the negatives in my opinion. I can most easily recommend this novel to fans of magical realism, as it has a lot of stylistic similarities to that genre. It will also greatly appeal to fans of regular realism who are maybe looking for something fresh. If I've sold you on the novel already, then by all means, please go and check it out before watching the rest of this video. Part of the reason why I love this novel is the surprises that it brings, so I think it's worth going into it with as little information as possible. There's a link in the description to the Amazon store page where you can purchase it. However, if you're still not convinced, I'll try to keep major spoilers to a minimum in this video, but I will nevertheless be talking about some aspects of the novel in detail. So if you are planning on reading the novel, here's where you ought to stop the video, go and read it, and then come back for some discussion afterwards. By the way, thanks to Robbie Arnott for letting me interview him. Hi, Robbie Arnott. That is how I pronounce your name. Is <laughs> Arnott? Yep, that's it. Yep. Hi, Nick. How are you? No worries. <laughs> I just realized this will be the first ever time on my channel where the author of the book I'm reviewing is going to see the video. <laughs> Hi Robbie, I hope the feedback is useful. when it came to writing a novel, I didn't actually set out to try and write about Tasmania in a specific way. I didn't have any really lofty goals about it. It just came out in my writing quite quickly as soon as I started describing the natural landscapes. So as that went on throughout the book, I started writing about different places and I found that these are the most pleasurable to write because there's something that is really, really inspiring about all the different landscapes on just one small island stuck in the Southern Ocean. I found that I wanted to represent Tasmania in a way that felt real, but also felt like it hadn't been done before, uh, which was a bit of a challenge. I wanted people to both recognize Tasmania in it, but also be surprised at their own recognition by doing it in a different way. I guess the main way I tried to do that was try to be as lyrical and descriptive as possible, even in the minutiae of, of the landscape that I was describing. Tasmania is an island of stories, and if you care to study storytelling in literature, you'll find that 
place is a very important aspect of a literary fiction. In movies, place can be conveyed simply by showing the landscape with a camera. In theatre, settings are more abstracted. The movement of the actors within a set is meant to give the impression that what you're seeing is happening in a place and not simply on a stage. Literature has no visual elements whatsoever, so setting construction has to be done entirely through language, making the abstraction of the place even more challenging than in something like theatre. Place is far more than simply describing what a setting looks like. Have you ever read a novel about a place and felt like you were transported there? Like even if you've never set foot in or even seen the location, or even if you know that the location doesn't exist, you can feel the majesty or magic of it like a nostalgic memory. The feeling that a fictional setting is tangible, even real, is what we call generating a sense of place. Flames might be a masterful example of building place with nothing but words, and the place it's tasked itself with representing is Tasmania. Unfortunately for my purposes, a big factor that comes with creating an evocative and tangible place in a fiction is simply the volume of its presence. Places aren't just characterised by what they look like or how it feels to be there, but mainly through the stories that take place within them. So spending the time to experience the stories of a place is the most effective way to give that place character. However, it's not guaranteed that those stories necessarily characterise the place. The reader needs some kind of association between the setting and the story that lets them know that it was the place that generated, catalyzed, or otherwise facilitated that story. And there are many literary techniques that can be utilised in the moment to moment of being in the place in order to create this association. Here's a good example from about midway through the novel, during the Feather chapter, set in a farm out in Millaluka, which by the way, is a real place. Other than the usual clamour of seabirds, ravens and swamp harriers, the only other birds of note in this area are orange-bellied parrots. Gorgeous, high-squawking, stupid creatures that migrate north every year, and a few black-faced cormorants that venture up from the tannin-stained waters of Bathurst Harbour. The largest of these lives in a blackwood tree that stands alone in a far field. Above the grave of the father's founder, Derek Korn, it is a territorial creature, often harassing our livestock if they stray into its paddock, but, to my knowledge, it has never so much as drawn blood from a wombat. I do not like to go near it, partly because I find the bird loathsome, but also because old Korn's paddock contains the mine shaft of the old Melaleuca tin mine. Any number of other shafts and sinkholes may have been obscured by the meadows of button grass. It would be easy to fall through such a trap, and it could take years before anyone found you. This is an example of a character describing an environment with which they are already familiar. You might notice that ongoing characteristics of the place are described in present tense. The only other birds of note in this area are creatures that migrate north every year. The largest of these lives in a blackwood tree. It is a territorial creature, often harassing our livestock if they stray into its paddock. Old Corn's paddock contains the main shaft of the old Millaluka tin mine. Presenting setting details in present tense frames them as characteristic of the place rather than something incidental to it. This distinction is important because if you were visiting an area for the first time and observed something notable while you were there, how are you to know if it's ordinary or unusual for that particular place? In literature, you can use the narrator's tense and aspect as a way to distinguish between them without needing to expressly spell it out. I don't think this needs to be said, as I am kinda stating the obvious here, but it is something that aspiring writers might want to keep in mind as they edit their drafts. Old Corn's farm itself is characterised as being treacherous and antagonistic, primarily through the descriptions of specific areas where the narrator character is prevented from venturing. Shafts and sinkholes are a believable threat from a landscape, however the use of paddocks and button grass conjure up images of soft rural places, and describing that these qualities obscure the trap of the hidden shafts and sinkholes give a deceptive quality to the landscape, like the place itself wants to lure you maliciously into its secret dangers. Talking about the birds of the area adds life to the place. The wild nature and variety of the birds textures the landscape as untamed and with far more going on than what the human characters concern themselves with. Another detail of Millaluka from outside of this chapter 
factor is that it's isolated by road, which is true of Millaluka in real life. It's only accessible by hiking tracks, boat or airplane. The novel establishes this with how Charlotte, and later on the detective, arrive at Millaluka, one by sea and the other by air. Because Millaluka is distinct and isolated, anything that takes place within it can much more convincingly add to the place's character. This characterization of the corn farm is early in its respective chapter, and it brilliantly sets the scene for the story to follow, which utilizes all the elements set up in this introduction to the place. The farm's paddocks house the main conflict of the chapter, the lives of the wombats on the farm, which motivate the central character into action. The cormorant is always referred to as belonging to Old Corn's paddock, tying it to the location, and it becomes a significant character in conflict with the farmer. The tin mine comes into play later in the chapter as well. The story of the chapter is made out of elements that early in this passage are established as being characteristic of the place. So this feels like a story that emerged not just from the who and the what, but also the where. There's plenty more that the novel does to generate a sense of place, but I hope this has been a decent first look at some basic techniques that can help out a lot. Polyphonic can be understood as meaning many voices, and when we would describe a text as polyphonic, or using a polyphonic narrator, we would be referring to a story that shifts between multiple distinct and mutually exclusive perspectives. The key to polyphony in literature is the independence of and contradiction between each of the voices. If three different characters narrate the story, but they're all nonetheless in total agreement with one another, then the text isn't really polyphonic because you could say that all three characters share one voice. The distinct characteristic of a polyphonic narrator is that each voice is unique and distinct. Incomplete and contrary accounts or interpretations are the bread and butter of polyphony in literature. In Flames, every chapter but one features a different voice. Chapter one is told in first person past tense from Levi's perspective. Chapter two is told in third person past tense from Carl the Fisherman's perspective. Chapter three is told in third person present tense from Charlotte's perspective. Chapter 4 is told in third person past tense from the Esk God's perspective. Chapter 5 is a correspondence of letters between two characters, which, by the way, when you tell your story by framing it as a series of documents, such as letters, is called epistolary format. A more extreme example of this would be Dracula by Bram Stoker. And the novel keeps up with these variations on narrator perspective for the entire story. One chapter is a series of diary entries, another is an excerpt from a woman's autobiography. One chapter might tell you events from a single day, while another chapter might cover weeks, and yet another chapter covers thousands of years. The chapter titled Grove is told in first person by Charlotte and begins with the sentence, I don't trust the detective. The detective in question is the perspective character of the chapter titled Ice, so we as the readers experience a contradiction between two of the voices telling us the story. On the one hand, we're put into the detective's perspective and asked to sympathise with her, while on the other hand, another principal character describes her as an untrustworthy intruder. And this isn't done just for the sake of polyphony. Charlotte is hiding from society at this point in the story, and the detective is someone she's never seen before, who shows up unannounced and wants to take her back. It makes sense for her character and her situation that she wouldn't trust the detective. That this also creates a divide between the voice of Charlotte and the voice of the detective is a bonus. Even things like changing whether the voice orating a particular chapter is omniscient or not can make a huge difference. In chapter one we follow Levi's perspective, but because he is the voice of the narrator, he can only tell us things that he himself witnesses and only has access to his own thoughts. These thoughts proved endless, and worrying and terrible, and the more Charlotte struggled, the more I worried. So I did what I thought was right. I started looking for a coffin, and I swore to bury her whole, and still and cold. Meanwhile, in the chapter titled Wood, we follow Levi again, but this time we're listening to a third-person omniscient voice, which allows the narrator to tell of things outside of Levi's perspective and have the reader consider different possible consequences to critical decisions that Levi makes. 
and there was a chance he'd understand this. A slim chance, but a chance nonetheless. The moment he saw the coffin, an epiphany might have dawned upon him. What am I doing? The key difference between the voices is that when we are occupying Levi's perspective, we're invited to sympathise with him. But when we are following him from an omniscient perspective, we're invited to judge and maybe even pity him. The two voices both give an honest recounting of Levi's story, however they are in disagreement with each other in their interpretation of Levi's character. Giving the reader both of these perspectives allows us to form a far more nuanced interpretation of Levi's character by contrasting his own limited understanding of his circumstances and actions against all of the things that he doesn't know are going on both around and inside him. Aside from what the polyphonic narrator lends to reader interpretation, it's also just very fun to read a story where the narrator perspective keeps changing. So I did write that first chapter. It went better than I thought it would, and I ended up having that published in an anthology. So I thought that was great, and I thought, I'm going to try and turn this into a novel. So I set about trying to write a novel all completely in the same style as those four, first four pages in the first chapter. And within 20 pages, I just run out of steam and couldn't keep the story going, couldn't keep it progressing, felt that it was getting laboured. So I just decided to write a second chapter because I had this idea about a fisherman and a seal and to link that back into the first one and then see how that goes. So I did that for two chapters and then I did it for three or four. By the time I'd done six and was vaguely plotting at the end of the book, it was kind of coming together and I'd never sat down and planned the whole thing out or had this big master scheme about drawing it all together. I was, As I was writing it, I was working about two chapters in front. All I wanted to do with each chapter was to make it surprising and interesting. You might be opening it and reading, well, hang on, what's this story? This is something completely different. And then to realise how it connects with the whole main narrative. I wanted it to be constantly surprising and interesting. Don't get me wrong, I still love character studies told from a singular perspective, but for more complicated and multifaceted stories like this one, having the freedom to adapt the voice of the narrator in accordance with the story's purposes can allow that author to maximise any given story element. There's one chapter in here that really leverages the particular voice that it uses, but I'm not going to tell you which one, because that would spoil the chapter. I want to see more authors tackle polyphonic storytelling. It's fun to write, it's fun to read, it's so good. Just do it, come on, give me more of this type of thing. Realism is a bit of a contentious label in fiction because human beings cannot represent reality totally unfiltered. Different groups of people have different interpretations on what representing a reality is, and as such we've ended up with several different styles of realism in literary storytelling, from Zola-esque naturalism to magical realism to social realism to socialist realism and even… okay, who even comes up with these? Traditional realism, with no additional qualifiers, as a storytelling style can probably be rudimentarily described as a story that the audience could reasonably believe to have happened in reality exactly as it's shown or described by the text. That's a very narrow stylistic range, obviously, but the reason why the style resonates with people is due to a heightened sense of authenticity. The more believable the story is, the more the audience feels like they're they're connecting with and understanding something truthful. That element of the realist style is what gets preserved between all the variations on realism. Flames has been described by the press as magical realism, which is arguably an appropriate label, although I'm always very hesitant to describe any fiction outside of Latin America as magical realism, because I don't know if it can really be divorced from the culture and geography from which it emerged. However, regardless of classification, there are enormous stylistic similarities between Flames and characteristics typically assigned to the magical realism genre. The setting takes place in real locations across Tasmania. The story by and large follows ordinary human characters, with 
a couple of exceptions. The main driving focus of the story is the human relationships and human spirituality. The story may contain magical elements, however the magic itself is not the core of the story's interest or engagement, and could even be read as largely metaphorical. For example, Charlotte uncontrollably summons fire when she becomes emotional, which is an overtly magical element of the story, however the fire itself can be read as the destructive impulses that erupt out of such an emotional character. In chapter one, those flames there were inspired by the Dunalley bushfires and other bushfires that occurred in Tasmania, particularly in the highlands, where a lot of really, really old growth forest has been burnt out and it's, it's never going to grow back. But as for the terms of the flames reappearing throughout the book and becoming that linking linking symbol. It's a bit hard for me to say. I just, I guess I stumbled upon it as something that would tie it all together. And then I came up with the idea of, of Charlotte, sorry, this is a bit of a spoiler, but Charlotte McAllister having the fire leaking out of her when she completely loses emotional control. The symbolism of that was, I really wanted to write this character in Charlotte who, who was very, very in tune with her emotions and completely expressive all the time, but that never made her weak. I, I really don't like this idea in fiction and this is idea in society that, that someone being emotional is a sign of weakness. And that's, that's the culture I grew up in. You know, women cry and that's weak. And when women are emotional, they're being unreasonable and irrational and, it's, and men should be stoic and hard and, and never, never show their emotions. And so what I wanted to create was a character who is extremely emotional, but it only lends to her strength. It never weakens her. Charlotte's fire is overtly magical, but it lends an authenticity to her emotions. The fire is a literalized manifestation of the metaphorical fire in her soul. A thin trail of blue tears, the same hue as the fire on the hill, was falling from Charlotte's eyes. The ranger thought she was burning, that sparks had caught in her hair, but then he realized, both understanding completely and not understanding at all, the tears were her flames, and they were coming from within Charlotte. Admittedly, at first I found the idea that Charlotte is leaking fire to be a little silly, but once I had gotten over that hurdle, the fire as representation of Charlotte's intense and violent emotional outbursts lent a strong believability to the emotions of the character. Thorsten Hugh, being attacked by the animals, does the same for the landscape. I am besieged in my own home by the creatures of the river. The last time I wrote to you they were only molesting me when I ventured near the accursed waterway. Now they are actively harassing me whenever I poke a foot out my front door. Yabbies tap their claws against my windows, glaring in at me with their demented bug eyes. Herons circle above my property like vultures on the plain. Eels squirm across my lawn to bite at my feet dying in packs on the grass. Drakes assault my outer walls with their horrid beaks and corkscrew genitalia. But the worst, the most persistent, the most hateful are the water rats. They have started digging at the foundations of my house like dogs at a beach. During daylight hours I shoot at them from my window, but at night they return, always in greater quantities than before, scratching, nibbling, and scouring away at the wood and dirt my house is built upon. In the darkness, I peer out and see the devilish lights of their eyes surrounding me as they scurry about, enacting their hell-driven mischief. I am sure that their number has climbed into the hundreds, and if I cannot find a way to stop them, I am equally sure that my number is up. From the violent assault against Thorsten, you really get the sense that the environment and the landscape itself is seeking out revenge or retribution. Thorsten's crime against the South Esk River is given added severity when you see such a sinister and malevolent retaliation against him. It gives the sense that Thorsten has deeply wounded the landscape itself. These examples, amongst many others, are the overtly magical elements of the story that literalize and lend authenticity to some of the more abstract or spiritual aspects of the narrative, like emotions or the idea that the land itself can be hurt and seek retribution. However, another characteristic of the magical realist style is in blurring the space between fiction and reality, and this is also present to an extent in flames. It's hard to tell what an author has completely made up and what is something that actually exists in that real place. That was what I wanted to achieve and that's why I did it. I wanted anyone to, who might end up reading it to not be quite sure what was real and what wasn't and, and for that to be part of the reading experience. And um, it's also just a lot of fun to make things up. 
that's what I enjoyed a lot doing it. So in a second chapter, there's there's a fisherman who who is in partnership with a seal and they hunt tuna. Um, and it's much in the same way that a farmer will be in partnership with a sheepdog. And I was inspired directly by that. I, I spent a lot of some time on farms and I have friends who have very close relationships with working dogs. And so all I did was look at that and then extend my imagination and try to put a bit of magic into it and make it feel both completely removed from reality, but also almost believable. Carl the fisherman isn't just any ordinary fisherman. His technique involves taming and forming a lifelong bond with a seal, who becomes his fishing partner. Together they combine their strengths to take down bigger and bigger game, always sharing what there is of the kill. And they become ever more inseparable as their combined skills develop and their reliance on each other becomes paramount, not just to their fishing adventures, but also to each other as individuals. Carl's chapter details the practice of using seal companionship in fishing, how it shaped Carl's otherwise ordinary life, and the decline of its success as more modern technologies are implemented in the fishing industry. Now, in reality, people don't actually use seals in fishing, but from the way it's described in the book, you might start to buy its authenticity regardless. Yeah, when when I was reading that chapter, I had a moment because for the most part, I, I was thinking to myself, OK, like, you know, this doesn't happen. You know, seals aren't in partnership with fishermen. But I had a moment near the end where I was like, wait, but does it? And I felt yeah. compelled to, like, look it up just in case. So you kind of, I yeah. think you did strike that balance. And all this is, by and large, what the magic in the story achieves. It lets the intangible, abstract elements of the story resonate stronger without sacrificing the authenticity of the characters and the setting. When you can't quite see the dividing line where realism ends and fantasy begins, it makes it that much easier to buy into the fiction as something authentic, even if you still know that none of it is real. trying to put stressed monosyllables at the end of most sentences. Um, that's a tip I picked up from Michelle de Kretzer, actually. She says, always try and always put stressed monosyllables at the end of um, <laughs> sentences. I started doing it and I realised, no wonder she always wins a nice, frankly. That's a really smart <laughs> Arnott's writing style is highly playful, and yes, part of that has to do with him finding a new variant on his style for each chapter, but it also comes from an unrelenting desire to craft original and lyrical lines. I do what I call um, cliché hunting, and I go around finding anything that's even like a conventional cliché, and I delete it, and then I find things that I think are just tired language, just an expected way of saying something, um, and I either change it or delete it and pair it back. I just don't think I have any use of heavily used language that is not working in a way that's pleasurable to read or different or interesting. I just get rid of it um, and unless I try and write in a more original way. It's pretty difficult for me to point this out exactly because I can't really just show you a line and explain all the ways that it defies writing conventions. However, there is one thing I can clearly point out for you about Arnott's writing that is probably useful for all the aspiring writers watching, and that is his use of writing motifs. I couldn't find an actual term for this, but when I say writing motif, I'm referring to something similar to the concept of a leet motif. In music, a leet motif refers to a sequence of notes or chords that is associated with a particular character or theme, and gets repeated each time that character or theme is introduced into the piece. A writing motif is a similar technique or flourish built from words, grammar, and or sentence structure used in the same way. I'll give you an example. Robbie's favourite writing motif, by far, is descriptions coming in beats of three, which is pretty evident in chapter two. The sand was hard and sharp and blowing up into Carl's shins. Whipped cruel by the dead northerly coming in over the white chopped sea, he increased his pace, trotting across the beach, juggling his bucket and tackle box and rod, heading for the boat sheds and the trial that lay between them, the one that curled through the boobiella and up to the smoky heats of his house and lounge and family. Okay, for old viewers, yes, I know I derided the three item endless list in a past video, but A, this is not the same thing, and B, since I made that video, I've reevaluated my stance, but I'm not going to elaborate on it here because I'm talking about something else. This is the first paragraph of the chapter Salt, which tells the story of Carl the Fisherman, and as far as I can tell, this opening paragraph is an entirely pragmatic inclusion. Carl is introduced walking down a beach brandishing fishing gear, and we're told that his family 
family home is nearby, letting us infer that he does this regularly. This character introduction is both clear and concise, which is fantastic, but the paragraph simultaneously sets up the writing motif as something for us to pay attention to in this chapter specifically. So this rhythm of things coming in threes will draw the reader's attention. Hard and sharp and blowing up into Carl's shins. It's kept to beats of three because that's bold enough to be noticed, but also concise enough to read well. However, the paragraph wants you to be looking out for this motif for the rest of the chapter. So to let you know it's important and deliberate, it appears in this first paragraph three times. So when you see this line later on... He swiveled and spun and swam in every direction, left, right, up down, north, south, but there was nothing but bubbles and navy and clicks. You know that you should be paying attention to this movement and try to decipher it based on the meaning that the writing motif has generated for you earlier in the chapter. I should be clear, writing motifs aren't only used for signposting, however it is a pretty decent and simple application that you can use if you're an aspiring writer starting out. However, it also pays to think about what meaning might be generated from the form of the motif itself. In this example, the rhythm of threes pulls elements together into groups, which can serve to illustrate the temporal compression of details. For example, when we're told that the sand is hard and sharp and blowing up into Carl's shins, the rhythm of threes brings all of these characteristics together to generate the singular experiential illustration of having dry sand pelt your legs. The same is true of he swiveled and spun and swam in every direction, but there was nothing but bubbles and navy and clicks. The technique compresses the elements of this moment into a singular experience. Carl does doesn't first notice the bubbles, then the colour of the water, and then begin to hear the clicks, it all happens to him simultaneously. You might remember from my video on Gabriel Garcia Marquez that I pointed out how using multiple ands, one after another, is a way that writers can stack details together into a singular instance. This is exactly that, but kept quite modest in comparison to the last voyage of the ghost ship. Late in the chapter, after his companion seal is killed by orcas and he gives up on fishing altogether, Carl's life becomes a miserable blur, despite his best efforts to try and enrich himself with meaningful experiences. This is illustrated by this use of the motif. He hiked white quartzite mountains and watched wombats stumble and stared out at the green button grass plains at this southern end of the world. The motif takes all of these separate experiences of Carl and summarises them all together as if Carl's life is now a fleeting experience that drifts past great swaths of time, which he barely notices go by. We know this not just from the writing motif signposting the significance of this sentence, but also by contrasting it against how it was used back when it was illustrating the instantaneous experiences of singular moments. So the rhythm of threes is a motif constructed using sentence form that has meaning unto itself and also signposts how meaning within the form of the text can be interpreted by the reader. Now it's not an especially sophisticated or original writing motif in and of itself. If I were to give Arnott some constructive feedback, I'd say that he ought to experiment around with the form of his writing motifs a little more. However, the way he applies this one in particular is pretty on point. Uh, stress monosyllables at the end of sentences and and kill all cliches. Uh, they're my <laughs> basic tips, really. But then, won't stress monosyllables at the end of sentence become cliches? Oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Something that I hope has been illustrated by lending Robbie Arnott's voice to this review is that authors are human beings at the end of the day. Even if they produce something wildly evocative and amazing, their brains can still only hold the same amount of information as yours. And there's nothing particularly special about their perspectives that lends itself to better writing or storytelling. You don't need to be a genius to write good fiction. What you need is hard work, knowledge, and practice. Even then, there's not a universal method for producing great fiction. Robbie and I actually disagree on certain strategies for writing. For example, during the interview he said this. Don't try and write for an audience, but try and just write what, what if you picked it up in a bookstore and you'd been hit over the head and you didn't know that you'd written it, um, that you imagine you would be drawn towards. Whereas in the past, 
I have said, It is crucial to the success of your work to think about who might read it and how they might read it. And that's probably because we come from different writing backgrounds. Robbie has experience in creative writing that emphasises self-expression, while my background in education is largely in journalistic writing where the audience takes precedence. There is a strategy that just universally seems to work though. A good reading diet. Read classic fiction by so-called great authors and absorb their talent through exposure. Someone like Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a huge influence on this, particularly 100 Years of Solitude. A really, really close inspiration for this book is Gould's Book of Fish by Richard Flanagan. David Mitchell's work was been quite a big influence, I think, and so the way he structures his chapters and the way he, he blends in things that are unreal with things that are real. And again, with the structure, A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan was a really large inspiration on, on how to try and connect a book together by using a, a range of different narrators. And Angela Carter and her story The Bloody Chamber, which reimagines old fairy tales and fables. Regardless of what kind of strategy you use for writing a novel, this tactic seems to work the most consistently for improving writing quality and storytelling skill. It's not often that you find a new author who comes out of the gate with something spectacular, but it's always a fantastic opportunity to experience something far more unique than you might find from a more established writer. Robbie Arnott is a brilliant example of a writer who thrives on using their own perspective, experiences, and imagination. Flames comes with an enthusiastic recommendation from me. There's a link in the description to an Amazon store page where you can purchase the novel. If you choose to read it, then I hope that you enjoy it. I also hope that you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next year. Excuse me, as I. Hey. Don't know this. Pizza. Well, I read to you my story.